Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, you are our hope, as we just sang, that you are the hope of glory, Christ in us. The light has come, and it shines, and it shines in us, and Lord, you intend for that light to shine through us. So as we begin a new year together, Lord, I pray this morning that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds, that you would shine your light in our hearts and minds, that we might know you more deeply, that we might follow you more faithfully. And Lord, that you would transform us more and more into who you desire us to be. May the words of my mouth today and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's people said, amen. So this is the first Sunday in the new year, 2024. Uh, can you believe that it's 2024? Uh, Tammy and I were reflecting the other day. We got married in 1999. And remember um, Y2K and 2000 in the turn of the century, we had our bunker built underground and all of our food supplies. I'm just kidding. But, you know, not really knowing exactly what was going to happen at the turn of the century. And then here we are. Like, this is a quarter, we're a quarter into this new century, which is wild. But even more importantly than the first Sunday in the new year, uh, today is the first Sunday in the season of Epiphany. Uh, Epiphany is January 6th each year. Uh, raise your hand, are you familiar with that word, or, or at least maybe the season, you maybe know the word. Um, Epiphany, it comes from the Greek, which literally means to bring to light or to make manifest. And Epiphany is the season in the church year, so you have Advent, which is all a time of waiting and expectation as we prepare uh, for Christ's arrival, for his birth. And then Christmas, and Christmas is more than just a day. In the church calendar, it's 12 days. It's its own season. And then January 6 marks the beginning of the season of Epiphany. And Epiphany, we're going to enter into this together um, because Epiphany now is about the season that, that the light has come, Christ has come, but now it's the season in which um, God wants to make manifest or reveal to us who this Jesus is and, and reveal to us what his mission is all about. So that's why, like last Sunday, I think on both of our campuses, we got to hear the story of the Magi from the East. That's often one of the stories we hear in Epiphany, that the Magi follow the star to Bethlehem. And, and one of the things that we learn right away about the kind of Messiah that Jesus is and about the nature of God's mission, and this is so important, is that, that Jesus has come not just for the Hebrews, not just for God's covenant people, Israel, but that this, Jesus is the light for all the nations. That this, this work of mission, this salvation that God brings in Christ um, is for the whole creation. And I want you to think about that as we head into this season of Epiphany, um, because I'm seeing it as an opportunity for us to be reminded, not just in terms of who God is in the nature of God's mission, but in light of who God is in God's mission, who are we? And what is our mission as the church? I see this as an opportunity to start this new year, to, to just be refreshed, Trinity, as, as to why we exist as a church together. Uh, what is our purpose? And I want to think about that collectively. I, I, I want to challenge you to think about that in terms of your own life. And what we're going to see is that, that mission is at the heart of who God is. That mission is not just kind of a New Testament idea, that, that Jesus comes and suddenly God's about mission in the world. But we're going to see that God, from the very beginning, the very character of God and God's action in the world has been about being on mission to restore this world and to make all things new. And, and that who we are as the church, like mission can't just be one aspect of what we're about as disciples of Jesus, but mission, being on mission with God, is at the very heart of our identity and calling as the people of God. So we're going to, in the season of Epiphany, we're actually, this may sound strange, but we're going to go back to the Old Testament. And you may say, but wait, I thought we were going to kind of talk about who Jesus is and his mission, and shouldn't we be in the Gospels? And, and here's the reason that I want to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to go to the story of Abraham and Sarah, which begins in Genesis chapter 12, and a couple reasons. One, I don't think we can fully understand who Jesus is and the nature of his mission without going back to Abraham and Sarah. This is a pivotal story in the unfolding drama of God's mission in and for the world. 
The second reason we're going to spend some time dwelling in this together is because I really wanted to, to, to have an Old Testament text for us uh, over the next six weeks for us to dwell in together. I want to spend some time kind of moving through a, a, a biblical story like this together. And my hope is that as we dwell in this together, that not only will we see how God is at the center of this story, but that it would open your eyes to see how God is at the center of your story and our story together as we move into this new year. So I'm gonna invite Michelle Christy to come on up, and she is gonna read for us Genesis chapter 12, verses one through nine. What translation are you gonna read from? ESV. So whatever translation you brought, you're welcome to follow along. So hear these words together with me from Genesis 12, one through nine. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to a place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will bring this land, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward Negeb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to God. Thank you, Michelle. So in Paul's letter to the Christians in Galatia, in Galatians, um, he in looking back on this story of Abraham and Sarah, Paul says something really interesting. He says that, that really this story of Abram, and they, their names get changed if you're wondering that. Like they begin with Abram and Sarai, later they'll get changed to Abraham and Sarah. But Paul says that the story of Abraham and Sarah is actually the gospel in advance. That's what he writes in Galatians, the gospel in advance. And I love that. Paul is saying that, that here in the story of Abraham and Sarah, uh, we see already the seeds of the good news of the gospel that will ultimately find their climax and fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So before we delve into then this story that is the gospel in advance for us, um, let, I, want to, I want to put it in context for you. Uh, let, me, let me give you a sense of how this story, Abraham and Sarah's story, fits into the, the unfolding drama of God's mission in and for the world. This may be a review for some of you, but for some of you, it may be the first time that you're kind of putting all these pieces together. So the biblical story begins with Genesis chapter 1 and 2, with God creating the heavens and the earth in the beginning, and God creates everything um, in the heavens and the earth, and we're told that, that God, by the power of his word and the power of his breath, the wind, ruach, the spirit, uh, God creates the world to be a place of goodness and beauty, wholeness, and flourishing. The Hebrew word that we often talk about is shalom, that Adam and Eve, the first humans, were created in God's image and likeness, and they were placed in the garden in order to be faithful and to multiply, uh, and then to be faithful stewards of this good creation that God had entrusted to them. So in the beginning, what we see in God's creational intent, what God intended was that there would be intimacy and flourishing in 
human, uh, humanity's relationship with God. There would be intimacy and flourishing in their relationship with one another. And there would be intimacy and flourishing in their relationship with all of creation. Then, tragedy strikes in Genesis chapter 3. A shrewd serpent deceives Adam and Eve and they rebel against God. They are no longer content just to be creatures, to be created in the image and likeness of God, but they want to be gods themselves. That's what's going on in this story. They want their own autonomy apart from God, and so um, they rebel against God, and sin enters the story, and as a consequence of that sin, God expels them from the garden and sends Adam and Eve east of Eden where they will live in this world that is now broken and fallen. Paul talks about in Romans 8 how because of their rebellion, the entire creation now is subject to futility and in bondage. To borrow a line from the theologian Calvin Plantiga or Neil Plantiga, um, things are not the way that they're supposed to be now. But even after Adam and Eve rebel against God and they find themselves living east of Eden in this fallen and broken world, God does not turn his back on them. Nor does God turn his back on the world. God stays in the story. God works through a man named Noah to purge the, the world of sin and wickedness with a flood and to give the world a fresh start, a new beginning. However, even after the flood, even after a fresh start, and God makes a covenant with Noah and his sons, and, and they get married, and, and they multiply and flourish, um, things then rather quickly grow dark again. We see, really, in the first, like Genesis 3 to Genesis 11, we see how the natural inclination of the human heart, as the beloved hymn puts it, is prone to wander and leave the God we love. In Genesis chapter 10, we're told that the world's nations, so the nations, 70 nations emerge from Noah's sons. I know I'm going quickly here, but I'm giving you a recap. 70 nations emerge from the sons of Noah, but the sad result is that as they multiply and expand, they fall into the same um, rebellion that their ancestors did back in Genesis chapter three. Adam and Eve, they too are not content to be creatures in the image of God, but they want to be gods themselves. Driven by an all-consuming desire, they build their own kingdom apart from God in the Tower of Babel. They construct this tower to reach heaven, and they do it out of their own ambition because they want to make a name for themselves. That's a key part in the story. They want to make a name for themselves. Again, they want a life of flourishing and success apart from God. So what does God do? God scatters them and he confuses them, and he confuses their language, and they begin to uh, speak all kinds of different languages, and God prevents them from pursuing their puffed-up, grandiose, self-centered projects. So Genesis chapter 11 really marks the climax of sinfulness's advancement uh, on the earth. And, and if the story ends here with the Tower of Babel in Genesis, uh, Genesis 11, friends, this, this is bad. If the story ends here, it ends with complete and utter tragedy. But thanks be to God, this is not where the story ends. We get Genesis chapter 12. And Genesis chapter 12, um, you, gotta, you gotta take it in the context of this. When it feels like everything has now descended back into chaos and darkness, like in the beginning, you know, when there was just chaos and darkness before God created the, the heavens and the earth, it seems like all hope has been lost. And then the story takes this sudden and unexpected turn. God calls this 75-year-old man <laughs> and his barren wife, these nomads who were essentially nobodies. And he speaks a call over their life, and he speaks a promise over them and into them. Here's how it begins, chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, the Lord said to Abram, it's just a few words in the Hebrew, and yet these are such powerful words the writer of Genesis wants us to hear an echo in these opening lines that point us back to Genesis chapters one and two. That in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, God said, God spoke, let there be light. 
In this opening sentence here, again, this is such a powerful turn in the story. What's going on here are at least a couple things that I really want you to notice. One is that the narrator is telling us right away that the story that is about to unfold, that this is gonna be a story that is about God. That God is at the center of it. It's Abraham and Sarah are gonna play an important part in this story, but they are not the central actors. They are not the heroes of the story. This is gonna be a story about who God is and God's mission and what God is up to. And what is God up to? What is God doing? Well, it's, it's remarkable when everything seems like it's collapsed back into darkness and chaos, God is doing something that is similar to Genesis chapter one and two. Some of the same language is being used to tell us this is an act of new creation. Genesis 12 wants to point us back to what God intended from the beginning and, and the same God who spoke light and, and, and who breathed life into the darkness and chaos, now is speaking light and breathing life into Abraham and Sarah, but not just for themselves, but for the sake of all the nations. There's a call here, that's what we refer to this story, is really the the call of Abram and Sarah, and there are two key things that I want to emphasize this morning as we begin this story together. With this call, and I want you to think about what this means for us, okay? What it means for you. With this call are two things. There's a command and there's a promise. It begins with a command. God said to Abram, well, what did he say? It's in the imperative, the Hebrew, go from, actually literally it's go forth, go forth, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. God commands Abram and Sarah to leave. These three things, I want to just say something about them. Your country would have been your land, okay, the place that, that's, that, that you've been a part of. Uh, your kindred would have been your tribe, you know, the, the people that you're a part of. And, and then your family, your father's house would have been your more kind of immediate kind of family. Now, in the na- uh, ancient Near Eastern culture, all three of these things, country, kindred, and father's house, were symbols of identity, they were, they were also symbols of security, of value, of worth, of safety. Um, a person got their name. That's an important phrase in the scriptures. They got their name because of the country that they were a part of, because of the tribe that they were associated with, because of the name of the family that they came from. And isn't it fascinating? God comes to Abraham and Sarah out of the blue. It says, I'm calling you, and the first command is to leave to leave the place, the people, your family, to leave the things where you have looked to for your identity and your safety and security. Can you imagine being in Abram's and Sarah's shoes and, and God coming and saying, okay, I want, I'm calling you to leave this place, to leave your community, to leave your family. And, and to go where? <laughs> what does God say? Abraham, leave everything that you know and go to the land that I will show you. How's that for specifics? To go to the land that I will show you. I mean, there's, there's not much detail given here at all. As those who are getting to hear the story narrated, we know that, that Canaan gets mentioned, and, but, but for Abram and Sarah, there, Abram, there's nothing like that. All that Abraham is told, leave. Leave your country, leave your tribe, leave your family, and Go. Go to the place that I will show you. Trust me. Abram doesn't know where it is. He doesn't know how long it's going to take to get there. He doesn't know what it's going to be like when he gets there. But he's simply called to trust God in faith and to obey. So there's the command. Leave. Go to this place that I will show you. But there's not just a command that's with this call. There's also a promise. And this is the part where, um, where there's, there's, there's the energy uh, in the story. This, this is the promise then that God gives Abram. God says to him, Abram, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. Do you, do you hear, by the way, the contrast with the Tower of Babel, this is very intentional, where the people were trying to make their own name great by their own ambition and effort apart from God. God says to Abraham, 
Abram, again, here's a nobody, right? These, these insignificant man and his wife. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The promise is that God will bless Abram and Sarah. Uh, this is such an important word in the story. I italicized it for you. It's the Hebrew word barak, and it shows up five times just in this part alone. And Bible commentators say, again, that's really significant because it's intended to um, be in contrast to or, or, or a counter to the five times that the word curse shows up in Genesis 3 through 11. Do you see what, what is happening here? God is saying to Abram and Sarah that I'm about to reverse the curse that, that, that sin and rebellion has brought, that I, I am about to do something new here that is gonna restore and set this right. Barak, I will bless you, and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now that word blessed, let's, let's talk about that just a little bit here, because I think that becomes kind of some of our Christianese it's kind of a churchy word often. You know, we use it, I, I use it a lot, and we don't always think about what we mean by it. Um, again, the word, the word blessed in Hebrew is barak, and, and the, the idea of it, we often use it like, you know, hey, God has blessed me. Often we, we probably use it when we're talking about good things that happen in our life or things that we're thankful for, and that's not wrong. That's partially right, but it's so much more than that. The word barak actually points back to Genesis 1 and 2, and, and blessing, Barak, uh, has to do with God's goodness, his life, his abundance, and flourishing as God designed it. So it carries it with it. Again, think of, think of, of blessed as this sense of, of flourishing and abundance and goodness as God intended uh, back in the garden. This idea of, of shalom, of people in right relationship with God and with each other and with all of creation. But it also points forward to God's intent then to restore all of creation. For God to, to redeem, to bring his redemptive purposes God says to Abram and Sarah, I will bless you. And part of that blessing, and you just need to know how wild this is, is that here's this old barren couple who have no hope really for much of a future, and God says, I'm gonna give you offspring. In fact, later we'll hear him say, God will take them out beneath the canopy of the stars and say, look up at the stars, and do you see all those stars? That's how many offspring you will have this God who can do the impossible. I will give you offspring, I will give you a land, I will give you a future. But the promise is not just for them. And this is the missional turn in the story. The promise is not just for them. The blessing, the life, the flourishing is not just for them as a couple. It's not just for their family that will grow. It's not just for the nation of Israel, which is what they'll become. But from the beginning, I want you to see this. From the beginning, the intent for God has been to call a particular people, Abram and Sarah, make them into a particular nation for the universal full, uh, flourishing and salvation of all the nations. A Abram and Sarah are called, they're gifted, yes, they're, they're blessed, but they're blessed with this comes this responsibility now. We often talk about the doctrine of election or being chosen. They do nothing for God to choose them. I mean, I want you to see that in the story too. There's, there's nothing that Abraham does that God says, okay, you qualify, you, uh, you, you know, you, you've kind of you know, earned your way for me to be able to use you in this way. This is all the initiative of God's grace that calls them and chooses them. But God chooses them not for their own sense of getting to kind of bask in that chosenness, but he chooses them for a purpose. He elects them for service, for mission. And the blessing is always given so that it might flow through us into the lives of the people around us. That's the key, one of the key verbs there. I will bless you, um, I will bless you and will make you name, your name great so that. Why? So that. Don't, don't miss the so that. If you miss the so that, we miss the whole point of it all. 
so that you will be a blessing. Michael Goheen, a missiologist, says that the Israel and we as the church now are called to be a so that people, that we have received every spiritual blessing in Christ, friends. I mean, that's the remarkable thing. Do you realize this, that you and I really, like in terms of, of, of heritage and bloodline, we have no chance to be in the family of God because every, I'm guessing that every single one of us here is a Gentile and not Jewish, and yet Paul says in Galatians, here's the remarkable thing of God's mission is that because of Jesus, you and I, now we also become the offspring of Abraham. You and I are now part of that seed We are engrafted, incorporated into the family of God, the body of Christ. You have received every spiritual blessing in Jesus, Paul says in Ephesians, but not for yourself alone. As we look at a new year together, friends, we're we're gonna be, I'm gonna be emphasizing this very, very strongly. Uh, One of the things that I'm hoping that can happen is I want us to cultivate a shared vision together of why we exist, Trinity, as a church. You've heard me say it before, I'm gonna say it really strongly all through the series, is that we do not exist for ourselves. We are not a church that's just about kind of forming this huddle together, and it's not just about the way that God has blessed us and the good gifts that God has given us. If if that's as far as it goes, we miss the point of, of why God has blessed us and called us to be his people, and that is for the sake of joining him in his mission. Let me land here this morning as we get ready to come to the table. It strikes me, one of the things that strike me, I'm thinking about, okay, practically, this part of the story, what might this mean for you and me today? And it strikes me that, that for Abraham, he, he is called, so this is God initiates this. It's, it has nothing to do with his ability to somehow earn this blessing. God in his grace wants to bless him and call, call him and, and Sarah, Um, to have this, this family and to be his people. But in order for the blessing to be real in his life and to flow through him, Abraham has to leave. And that's a really important part of the story. Like Abraham, he has, he has agency here. He and Sarah, they have a choice. They can say no to God. They don't. That's what's so remarkable is that, that they, they step out in faith. It's amazing. And they go, but they don't have to. But what we see is that it is only in the leaving, the laying down, letting go of what's familiar, of the things that we look to for our ultimate identity and worth and value, it's only in the leaving as we act in obedience that we experience the blessing. We don't earn it, but our leaving and faithfulness is a way in which we receive the blessing in our lives, and it's the way in which the blessing flows through us into the lives of others. So I have two questions for you today as we think about this together. As we begin this new year, if you are personally, and for us together, if we're gonna step into the mission of God and this new thing that God wants to do in us and and where God wants to take us, What do you need to leave? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to lay down? Now maybe for some of us there will be a physical kind of leaving. We we are being called to leave a place or to leave a relationship that's holding us back and keeping us from really being what God intends us to be. But I'm guessing for most of us it's gonna be more metaphorical and it's, it's, not, it's maybe changing the way that we relate to the place where we already are or the relationships that we already have. But maybe for you, I was thinking about this for myself. Okay, Brian, what am I holding on to that's getting in the way? What do I need to let go of? Maybe for you, it's something in your past today. It's a regret. It's some shame. It's holding you back. It's keeping you from experiencing the blessing that God wants to pour into your life and through you. Or maybe for you, it's, it's a fear right now. Or maybe it's a worry about the future. There are some of us, what's holding you back is is resentment and bitterness. And there's somebody that you need to forgive in order for you to be able to be set free to receive this blessing that God wants to 
pour into you. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's, it's something that you're looking to for your identity, a relationship that you're looking to that person to be the source, that you're looking to them to be for you what only Christ can be. Or maybe it's your work, or maybe it's your education. Good gifts, but, but they become idols when we look to these things to be the ultimate source of our blessing and identity. What do you need to let go of? What do you need to lay down? What do you need to leave behind? Really, I'm, I want you to think about that right now. And then my second question, because there's a double imperative. Go, leave, leave. And then this other double imperative in Genesis 12 is be a blessing. Dallas Willard, in one of his final books that he wrote, um, said something I just love. He said, he was talking about discipleship and the Great Commission and what it means to be on mission with God. And he, says, he said, I wonder if we make this too complicated. And he said, if this, if, most simply, what if being on mission with God and being a disciple of Jesus is simply about being a person of blessing? And he said, a person of blessing is a person who projects, this is the way he talks about, who projects life and goodness into the lives of others, who speaks it, who speaks life into others, but who doesn't just speak life, but a person who acts in such a way that wills the good, that desires the good and the flourishing of the people around them. And he, and he raises this question, and it just, it's just kind of convicted me as I've been thinking about this. He says, do other people, when they think of you, do they know you as a person of blessing? Is that how they would describe you? Or are you somebody who diminishes others or sucks life from others or makes them small? I was thinking about this. I wonder if Tammy would see me in my, in my marriage, am I a person of blessing to my wife? Am I bringing life to our relationship, to her? Am I a person of blessing as a father? Am I breathing life and flourishing into my kids? As a grandfather, what about my neighborhood? Do my neighbors, like do my neighbors see me and Tammy? Are, like are they grateful that we're there as a family? Are we bringing flourishing to our neighborhood? What about your workplace, the people you work around? Would they describe you as a person of blessing? or the institution you're a part of, or the school that you're a part of, or the dorm that you live in? And, and, and what if people saw Trinity Church as a community of blessing? And this is a people who breathe life and goodness and flourishing into the community. What's God saying to you this morning? What is maybe God asking you to change about the way you're showing up? in the places where he has put you, in the relationships he's given you. Here's my practical challenge for you this week. Each day, ask God, Lord, help me to be a person of blessing, an instrument of flourishing in whatever places I go today and in whatever, whatever relationships that you've given me today. May I be a person who speaks life and who breathes life. And friends, I think that's where the missional life begins. Let's pray. God, thank you that, that you have called us, not because of anything that we've done to deserve it or to earn it, but you have called us to be your people. And in Jesus, we have every spiritual blessing. You have made us right with you, Father. You, you are renewing us and restoring us and helping us become who you desire us to be. But Lord, we're reminded again today as we begin a new year together that, that this blessing must flow through us into the lives of the people around us and the places where you have put us. So as we come to the table today, Lord, may this bread and this cup be a blessing to us so that we can be a blessing. Lord, may we experience your presence in this bread and this cup that we might be strengthened in our faith to not only trust you, but to obey, to be faithful. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things, amen.